Recently, my friend Rob Solberg responded to a video I did on Mark 7 in regard to the ongoing validity of the Torah's dietary laws. Here is my response to his response. I want to keep this response as short and concise as I can, therefore I won't be rehashing all the information I covered previously in depth. For context, I recommend watching my first video and then Rob's rebuttal to that video, which I will link below. Before responding to the points I made in my video, Rob spends some time at the beginning of his video giving an overview of Mark 7 and articulating his theology concerning the New Covenant. Rob agrees with me that Jesus emphasized matters of the heart and that Jesus inaugurated the New Covenant, which writes the Torah on our hearts. Where Rob differs from me is that he thinks that the fact that Jesus emphasized matters of the heart implies that Jesus therefore invalidated certain literal commandments, like the dietary laws. However, this seems like a non sequitur. The prophets, like Isaiah, also prioritized matters of the heart over certain ritual aspects of the law, like the Sabbath, for instance. But the prophets did not mean to suggest that commandments like the Sabbath are therefore no longer necessary. Similarly, when Jesus emphasizes matters of the heart, he is not negating God's literal commandments. We can see this, for example, in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Jesus emphasized the heart behind the commandments not to commit adultery and not to murder. By emphasizing the heart behind those commandments that we should not lust or hate our brother in our heart, he was not negating the literal commandments. It's not okay to therefore murder someone as long as you don't hate them. Another point of disagreement is that Rob thinks that the inauguration of the New Covenant results in some literal commandments, like the dietary laws, being made irrelevant for Christians. My position is that the Torah being written on the heart does not negate any literal commandment, but instead gives Christians the desire to obey the Torah, including the food laws, as Ezekiel writes. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Like Rob points out, the context of this verse is the New Covenant. Like Jeremiah, when Ezekiel gave this prophecy, he really meant what he said. In the New Covenant, God empowers us to keep his Torah. And for Ezekiel and Jeremiah, who both wrote about the New Covenant, God's Torah, his statutes, and his rules include the dietary laws. Rob wants to redefine what these passages plainly say and suggests that the law being written on our hearts does not include certain literal commandments like the dietary laws. He wants to say that the literal application of those laws become uh, replaced by some sort of spiritual internal application. God's law under the new covenant graduates from tablets of stone and external rituals in the physical world to the human heart and the attitudes and commitments of our internal world. Under the new covenant, it's about the state of our heart rather than rituals. But as New Testament scholar Matthew Thiessen points out, apart from certain Christian presuppositions, there is really no reason to think that the biblical authors understood these prophecies to exclude things like the dietary laws. We need to go back to what the biblical authors had in mind when they wrote scripture, instead of importing our own traditions and ideas into the text. Moving on, in my original video, I highlighted four reasons why Bible scholars disagree with the traditional interpretation of Mark 7 that Rob holds to. I want to respond to Rob's critiques of each of those reasons I gave. My first point was that the traditional interpretation of this passage makes Jesus a hypocrite. It doesn't make sense for Jesus to invalidate God's commandments concerning food immediately after condemning the Pharisees for invalidating God's commandments. Here's how Rob responded. I don't believe that Jesus was doing away with or invalidating God's commandments. Decades after the resurrection, as belief in Jesus continued to grow and spread, the author of this gospel sat down to capture in writing the actions and teachings and accomplishments of Jesus. And in chapter 7, we find the author, whoever he is, relating the story of Yeshua's conflict with the Pharisees over this issue. And he cites Jesus' teaching about how it's what comes out of a person's heart, their inner self, that defiles them, rather than what goes into their physical body. And then, the author adds a sort of summary statement. He says, thus, he declared all foods clean. Thus, he declared all foods clean was a summary statement by the gospel writer. The author's recounting what Jesus taught during his earthly ministry and providing his readers with a, with a summary 
of what the author now understood it to mean from a, from a new covenant post-resurrection perspective. So, Rob states that he does not think Jesus invalidated the commandments, but then he goes on to explain that the dietary laws are no longer relevant to believers because Jesus inaugurated a new covenant. Rob doesn't seem to grasp that the result of his belief is that the commandments concerning food are now invalid. They no longer apply to us. Rob is more explicit in his original quote that I used in my video. Quote, Jesus taught that all foods are clean, and as God incarnate, all foods became clean at his word. Thus, any of his listeners who decided to begin eating previously unkosher foods at that time would not have been in violation of the law. If Jesus' word in that moment made it so that people were not in violation of the law when they ate prohibited food, how is that not invalidating the commandment? Rob also states that Jesus did not teach that the dietary laws were done away with. He says that it was actually the author of Mark who later in interpreted Jesus' teaching that way. In other words, according to Rob, Jesus did not teach against the law, Mark did. But isn't it problematic to suggest that the gospel writers misrepresented Jesus' intent in his teaching? And if we say that Mark interpreted Jesus' teaching accurately, then we still have the problem of Jesus teaching that the dietary laws are now invalid. Mark only later understood the implications of Jesus' teaching. In any case, the result is the same. It seems to me that Rob, for whatever reason, wants to have it both ways. He doesn't want to say that Jesus did away with the commandments, but he also doesn't want to say that the commandments are still relevant to us. Say what you want about Andy Stanley, but at least Andy Stanley is extremely upfront about what he believes regarding God's law. Rob has practically the same theology as Andy Stanley on this issue, but he is way less upfront about it. Now, I think Rob is sincere, and he probably just does not recognize the logical inconsistencies in his statements. In any case, I propose a more consistent and accurate interpretation of Mark 7, which is that Jesus did not invest validate God's commandments concerning food, and that Mark did not interpret him as doing so either. This is a much better interpretation, which is way less theologically problematic, since it allows Jesus to be faithful to the Torah, and it also allows Mark to have faithfully represented Jesus' teachings. Moving on, in my video, I pointed out that the controversy in Mark 7 concerned ritual handwashing, not the Torah's dietary laws. Rob responded to this point by agreeing with me that the context of the passage is a controversy regarding ritual handwashing. However, he states that there is basis for reading a broader principle into the text. David's right that this passage starts with the Jewish leaders asking why his disciples weren't following tradition and washing their hands before eating. And then Jesus did rebuke them for that, saying, you leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And it's precisely this statement that introduces the dietary laws of the Torah into the conversation. And then in verse 19, the author of the gospel adds a statement that specifically targets the kosher food laws, saying, thus he declared all foods clean. The problem with Rob's response is that Jesus appeals to God's commandments as an argument against the Pharisees' traditions. Jesus is assuming the validity of God's commandments. This goes back to my first point that it doesn't make sense for Jesus to teach that some of God's commandments are invalid immediately after appealing to the commandments. Jesus bringing up the commandments, assuming their validity, in contrast to the Pharisees' traditions, is actually an argument for my side. Regarding the statement in Mark 7:19, Rob is approaching that verse already assuming that it is addressing the Torah's dietary laws instead of allowing the surrounding context to inform how the verse should be interpreted. In other words, Rob is begging the question instead of letting the text speak for itself. He also assumes that the final clause in Mark 7:19 is Mark's summary statement, but he does not demonstrate this textually. He just assumes it. In my original video, I provided grammatical arguments for why the final clause is not Mark's commentary, but actually a continuation of Jesus' words. Rob is certainly free to disagree with me, but to merely assume and reassert a certain position without addressing the arguments of the person you're responding to who refuted your position is not particularly persuasive. Moving on, in my video, I brought up the point about how Mark's earliest readers did not understand Jesus' teaching in Mark 7 to be a rejection of the dietary laws. Rob responded to this point by agreeing
agreeing with me that Matthew used Mark as a source for his writing. However, he disagreed with my claim that Matthew 15 makes explicit that the controversy concerned only ritual hand washing, not the Torah's dietary laws. I mean, David suggests that Matthew emphasized the topic of eating with unwashed hands in order to clear up any, any potential uncertainty about Mark's comment that Jesus declared all foods clean. But there's really no textual basis for that claim. And I say that for three reasons. First, because Matthew's account makes no mention of Torah food laws. And you don't clear up ambiguity on an issue by not talking about it. Secondly, if you read Matthew's version by itself, there actually isn't a strong emphasis on the topic of eating with unwashed hands. It's mentioned once at the beginning of the passage and once at the end. And lastly, nothing in Matthew's account contradicts or undermines the conclusion in Mark 7 that by teaching about defilement coming out of the human heart, Jesus was declaring all foods clean. Regarding Rob's first point, the fact that Matthew does not mention the Torah's food laws actually supports my point that the controversy in Mark 7 did not concern the Torah's food laws. If Mark 7 really did speak to the Torah's food laws, we would expect Matthew, one of Mark's earliest readers, to have mentioned it, but he doesn't. Regarding Rob's second point, I don't really understand why he thinks the topic of hand washing is not emphasized in Matthew 15. It literally frames the entire narrative. Narrative. New Testament scholar Matthew Thiessen suggests that Matthew included verse 20 at the end of the narrative, quote, to ensure that readers do not, to his mind, wrongfully extrapolate from Jesus' words in this story to conclude that Jesus has rejected the Jewish dietary laws. Regarding Rob's third point, he is actually agreeing with me. Mark and Matthew do not contradict each other. That is because the controversy concerned ritual hand washing, not the Torah's dietary laws. If Matthew understood Mark to be addressing the dietary laws, it is perfectly reasonable to expect that he would have mentioned it in his account. The fact that he does not mention it indicates that the dietary laws were not in view in Mark 7. Moving on, in my video, I brought up the point that Jesus' earliest followers did not understand Jesus to have invalidated the Torah's dietary laws. One point I make in support of this claim is that Peter still kept the Torah's dietary laws long after Jesus' teaching recorded in Mark 7, which is not what we would expect if Peter understood Jesus' His teaching to have invalidated those commandments. Here's how Rob responded. First, although Peter was an eyewitness to the clash with the Pharisees over unwashed hands, Jesus never spoke the words, thus he declared all foods clean during that interaction. Remember, those weren't the words of Jesus, but rather a summary statement added decades later by the author of the gospel. So at the time Peter had his vision in Acts 10, the Gospel of Mark wasn't even written yet. Rob responds to this point by assuming, without demonstrating, that the final clause in Mark 7.19 is a summary statement from Mark. And then he says that Mark 7.19 was not written until after Acts 10. So Peter did not have access to Mark's alleged interpretation of Jesus' teaching. But as Rob mentioned earlier in his video, Mark was Peter's younger companion, and Peter would have been one of Mark's sources of information. So again, it does not make sense for Peter to have responded the way he did in Acts 10 if he understood Jesus' teaching recorded in Mark 7 as a rejection of the dietary laws. Peter was Mark's source of this information, as Dr. Michael Brown writes, quote, several years after the resurrection of the Messiah, Peter still had never eaten anything impure or unclean, and the command to do so was shocking to him. Yet many scholars believe that Peter was a key source of information for Mark's gospel. If his master and teacher had revoked the dietary laws, as some have understood Mark's 719, surely Peter would have understood, especially if Peter had been a primary source of Mark's information. Rob also agrees with me that the earliest Christians did continue to obey the dietary laws. However, he says that they continued obeying the dietary laws simply because it was their tradition to do so, not because they believed that they should. But this explanation seems ad hoc. A more plausible explanation is what I suggested, which is that they continued obeying these commandments because they believed those commandments still applied. Applied. In any case, the fact that the earliest believers continued to keep the dietary laws is not what we would expect if they understood Jesus' teaching in Mark 7 to have invalidated the dietary laws, as Dr. David Rudolph writes. Quote, even after the Mark 7 19b text was well attested in the early church, enough ambiguity surrounded its meaning that many believers, Gentile and Jewish, continued to abide by aspects of the biblical dietary laws. 
Moving on, finally, regarding my interpretation of the final clause in Mark 7.19, Rob does not offer a response but merely dismisses it as a crappy theory and then reasserts his position. This strikes me as a crappy theory. I mean, with all due respect to David, who's a lovely man with a genuine faith, it seems like in an effort to avoid the very legitimate implication here that the Torah's kosher food laws are no longer required, in an effort to sidestep around that implication, David has inadvertently placed one foot in a pile of well, you get the idea. Now, since Rob did not offer any rebuttal to my grammatical arguments or the historical insights regarding Jewish views of ritual purity, there is really nothing here to respond to. I would just note that my quote-unquote crappy theory is not unique to me, but is based on the comments of New Testament scholars David Garland, who wrote about it in the NIV application commentary for Mark, and Dr. Logan Williams, who won SBL's Paul Ochtemeyer Award for New Testament scholarship for his work on this passage. Williams goes further to demonstrate that this rendering of the verse is widely attested in church history, and I would recommend checking out his lecture at Houston Baptist University for more. Now, Rob certainly does not have to agree with what New Testament scholarship says regarding this verse, but again, merely dismissing their arguments without addressing them and reasserting his own view without proving it is not persuasive. Nevertheless, Rob made a great effort, and I thank him for his interaction. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching this video video. I hope you liked it. If you did like it, consider giving it a thumbs up and sharing your thoughts in the comments below. Also, if you want to see more content like this, I want to invite you to subscribe to my channel. You can also hit that little bell so that you'll be notified when new videos like this are released. I'll see you next time. Blessings and Shalom.